Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's 6.02 on Thursday, December 15th, 2022. So welcome, good evening. This is our first event in the Underwood Conservation District's Winter Workshop Series. Uh, my name is Toba Tillinghast and I'm, I'm the director here at Underwood Conservation District. Um, and I'm joined by two other staff members from UCD, Jan Thomas and Corey Podolak and they'll both be speaking in a few moments. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight and taking the time to be here. And uh, some of you are here to present and teach us about our subject matter tonight. And some of you are here to learn and I, I appreciate all of you for being here. So we'll be learning more about the Tree of Heaven and its potential companion, the Spotted Lanternfly. And this is an emerging and very important issue to really all the residents of the Columbia River Gorge in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we all need to know about this topic and how to prevent problems here in the Pacific Northwest. And we're thrilled to have um, additional experts here tonight to share their expertise and help answer specific questions. So I'll introduce them in just a few moments. <coughs> All right, so as I mentioned, this is the first of our um, workshop winter series. Um, and last year's have all been recorded and the year before that as well. So online, we have those recordings available to view um, on our website and you can look under news and events to find those. Um, tonight's is being recorded as well. So if you have neighbors and friends and family that missed it, uh, they can go find it later as well. Um, just give us a few days to get that online. We'll also have slides assembled and in a PDF slide deck for future reference. Uh, so you can go back and learn about this topic and any of the other past topics at a later date. Um, and let's see, as you can see, the, the next two workshops are coming in January and February. We'll have a UCD year in review to talk about um, what we've done in the past year at UCD. We have a, quite a wide variety of work that we've been doing, including habitat enhancement work and stream bank stabilization work, uh, the farm tool library that opened in White Salmon this past year. Um, and we'll even touch again on the Tree of Heaven work that we're doing. So you'll get to hear a good roundup of all of our activities, plus a sneak peek at our new long range plan that we are just finalizing this month and we're hoping to have that in a state that we can share with you at least in a in a preliminary sneak peek way. Um, and then in February you see that we have a, an in-person event happening at the Mountain View Grange all about wildfires in the Columbia Gorge and we'll have a panel of uh, experts and people that are working in the realm of wildfire in the gorge and they'll all be able to explain um, what they're working on, how they're working with lands and um, landowners to help reduce fuels and reduce the risk of wildfire. So um, more details to come on that, but please mark your calendars and save those dates for these future events. Um, also, if you're on our website, check out our latest e-newsletter. We send those out every other month and you can subscribe if you're not already subscribed. You can learn about our other programs and services. And right now we have our native plant sale going on. So. Um, We've already had a, a, a lot of sales that just came right out of the gate when we opened it up at Thanksgiving. So um, a lot of folks have already purchased, but we do have uh, plenty of plants left. And just let us know if you have questions about what to order or um, anything at all about our plant sale. And thanks to Jan, Jan, she's the one that really heads that effort up for us here at the district. And then in March, we'll have an event called Tree Fest, and that's where we distribute those pre-ordered sa uh, pre sales, but also we'll have a day of sale in addition on that day. It's gonna be actually March 18th. So one more date to log in the, in the memory bank there. Um, and with that, I will turn over to Jan here. Um, she's gonna be tonight's moderator and she has a few logistics to describe as we get started. Ooh, thanks Tova and um, welcome everybody and good evening. I am here to help support the Zoom and help everybody um, get through this smoothly here. So just a couple of these logistics. Um, I think we've all done the Zoom thing now, but if you can keep yourselves muted unless you're uh, speaking, that helps with background noise. 
Um, we do definitely invite your questions and you can do that um, two ways tonight. You can either um, use that little raise your hand icon at the bottom and I can call on you. Um, that's when you'll unmute and ask your question directly. Or if you prefer, you can just throw things in the chat and I'm happy to read those out um, uh, for the, everyone to hear. So those are the two um, ways we'll ask questions. We're gonna have a couple of different opportunities tonight. So we're gonna take a quick question break after each presenter. Um, and then we'll also have kind of a longer Q&A for all of our presenters um, at the end of the night. So uh, either way, um, feel free to ask your questions. So we wanna make sure that we're getting everything answered for you. We are also gonna have a couple of polls throughout the night. Those should just pop right up on your screen and you can just click your answer and then it will go away for you. We'll share those results. Um, let me know if you're having any trouble with those, but it should be hopefully pretty smooth. Um, yeah, I'll just be here on the uh, back end helping with Zoom. So if you're having any problems, um, put it in the chat box. Let me know and I can help uh, try to troubleshoot with you. I think that's everything. So Tova, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. Um, so here you can see our plan for tonight. Um, and we are finding that this online approach using Zoom is working pretty well for workshops. Of course, we miss seeing everyone face to face in person, but um, hopefully you enjoy the benefits of being at home and um, maybe sitting by the fire with your slippers on and drinking a hot cup of tea. Um, so uh, we're excited to see increased participation also with these online forums because uh, folks from um, far and beyond can access this event uh, right now. So we'll have a poll question in just a minute just to see where all of you are from, but we do see advantages from these online workshops we're holding. Um, so thanks for bearing with us as we go about it this way this time. Um, and we'll uh, get going with our program in just a minute, but first we'd, like, we'd really like to know more about you and the audience. Um, especially where you're located and if you live in the Columbia Gorge region or beyond. We'll put up a quick poll here for you to answer. Give people just a minute. <clears throat> hmm. Just a couple more coming in here. Joe, I'm not Share sure. Our sure. Results with everybody. One person says they can't see questions four and five, and I think you can scroll down. Hopefully that helps. We will have a couple of polls just to keep folks awake tonight <laughs> make sure you're paying attention um so there will be a quiz watch out yeah <laughs> but anybody there so i'm gonna end that and share the results with you that showing up for shared results Let me know if I need to scroll down or can you all see them all right now or. I'm able to scroll through. So that's really interesting. We have a pretty even split of the attendees between Klickitat and Skamania County and a few from outside the area. Um, lots of landowners and land managers and some smaller acreages represented, maybe even urban areas. Lots of folks are familiar with Tree of Heaven, so that's great to start off. Um, and yeah, lots of reasons why we should be concerned 
about Tree of Heaven and other invasives. Good. Cool. Well, that's all interesting. Thank you for participating in that. So you can close that when you're done looking at it. I think that's all up to you. And then um, we'll carry on. And I, I just wanted to give a really quick overview of Underwood Conservation District. We're hosting tonight's webinar and um, really helping manage this um, Tree of Heaven control project in on the Klickitat County side of things, um, coordinating a lot of partners and players that you'll hear about. Um, but first of all, just to tell you a little bit about us, um, we're Underwood Conservation District, and we're named Underwood because that's where we started back in 1940 in Underwood, Washington. Um, but today, our district covers all of Skamania County and Western Klickitat County. So you can see the main communities that are in our district, and um, it even includes Mount St. Helens. A lot of our district is federal lands, though, um, and we really primarily focus on the private lands in the district. So we're often um, focused down along the Columbia River and up the main tributaries like the White Salmon River um, and the Wind River. So uh, we work with private landowners providing all types of natural resource assistance and we're primarily grant funded. So really um, a lot of our work, we have to go out and apply for a grant to do that work. So it may be salmon recovery work or for example, tree of heaven control work that you're hearing about tonight. But we have to identify those projects first and then go get grants. And once we're funded, that's usually when we can start the, the actual project. So there can be a little bit of a lag time there, but um, we're a local agency and we're very flexible with the type of work we can do and, and um, are able to respond to needs when they when they show up, when, when we can get funding. So go ahead to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's just a, a um, list, kind of a laundry list of all the different types of projects that we can cover. Um, like this, where we hold educational workshops and seminars and field trips. We can do one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with landowners. We can offer conservation planning and project development and um, even some cost share on high priority projects. And this can take many different forms, working with livestock owners for things like manure management um, or water quality protection. We can work with forest landowners and uh, help with fuels reduction work um, and thinning. And then we have our native plant sale, as I mentioned, and the annual tree fest in March. So that's a, a perennial event for us. Um, and we, we just really cover a whole gamut of natural resource concerns from oak woodlands to fish habitat, uh, wildfire risk reduction to urban habitat and backyard habitat. Um, we have a, a yard by yard habitat program where it's basically a self-paced checklist for landowners to walk themselves through um, and select what types of practices are going to be most appropriate for themselves in their yards. Um, but it's got a lot of great ideas and resources and we can offer one on one technical assistance to help support landowners with those efforts um, in your own backyard. So check that out. Um, one thing that hasn't made this list yet, I need to add it, is our farm tool library. And that's located in White Salmon. And we, we offer a wide variety of different hand tools. Um, our largest tools are a manure spreader and a no-till drill, and even a yeoman's plow or a key line plow. So for um, farmers who are managing acreage um, and, and trying to improve soil, soil health, uh, we can offer those larger tools as well for rental. So uh, reach out to us if any of these programs strike a chord with you, or if you want to know more about them, we're happy to tell you more. Next slide. Um, I do want to announce that um, every year we elect, uh, we have an election, and, and not a lot of people know about that, but our Board of Supervisors is a five-member board of volunteers. Um, at least two of them are here tonight, Barbara and, and Joe. And um, we really rely on these board members to help guide our work and approve the, the work that we do. So again, three are elected. So that means um, with their three-year term that every year we're holding a public, a public election and um, registered voters in our district can vote but it's not on the public ballot that you receive in the mail from the county. Uh, we hold this election every year and this year um, we'll be holding that uh, in January and February. So it's a mail-in election. You can request a ballot by January 31st through our website. 
and those ballots are not out yet. They're not, it's not up on the website yet, but it will be soon. And then you'll have through January 31st to request a ballot and then submit your ballot back um, to us by February 21st. So um, right now, Chris Shadell is the supervisor that's up for re-election. Um, as far as I know, she's the candidate, but we may end up having additional candidates as well. So we do have these public elections every year and, and um, just something to keep a lookout for. And if you register for our e-newsletter, you'll get notice of those um, when they occur. So we'd welcome your participation in the election. Next slide. All right, so back to our program. Um, I want to introduce our speakers tonight and um, Unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to duck out a little bit early. So I'm kind of queuing everyone up and um, I've been really excited to work with everybody already to, to get this program going, um, but I'm gonna to have to take off for a Christmas high school band concert. Um, so I'll, I'll quietly exit at some point, but um, you'll be in good hands with everybody else here. And so I wanna introduce our speakers. We have Joshua Milnes with Washington State Department of agriculture, and he will be talking about the threat of Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly and other statewide efforts. He graduated with a master's in entomology from Washington State University and has a broad research background and skill set. His career started with studying biological control of the brown marmorated stink bug in the apple industry. In 2020, Mr. Milnes joined Washington State Department of Agriculture to co-lead the apple maggot statewide survey and to study biological control of the apple maggot complex. Recently, Mr. Milnes was made coordinator of the Spotted Lanternfly program at WSDA. Mr. Milnes believes educating the public is key to preventing the establishment of invasive species in Washington state in the greater Pacific Northwest. We'll also hear from Corey Podolak and she'll describe tree of heaven control efforts that we're doing at Underwood Conservation District in the communities of Bingen and White Salmon. Corey joined the UCB staff in August of 2022 to help take on the tree of heaven control project and Corey has a Bachelor of Science degree in natural resources from Oregon State University and has recently changed her, her career trajectory from certified veterinary technician back to her other passion, environmental conservation. Um, Emily Stevenson has been with the Skamania County Noxious Weed Control Program since 2014, and she's the coordinator there. Um, she's also been a member of the Columbia Gorge Cooperative Weed Management Area since 2007. And I know there's way more to tell about Emily, but she didn't give us, <laughs> didn't give us more. So you'll get to hear from her in a, in a few minutes. Um, Phoebe Judd is the 4-H Mentoring Program Coordinator for Washington State University Extension and the Drug-Free Communities Coordinator for Skamania County. And during the summer, she switches roles and helps to run Forest Youth Success with Summer Mead. Phoebe obtained her environmental science degree from Western Washington University and enjoys working with youth in the outdoors where she can share her knowledge. Uh, let's see, Marty Hudson, who is not presenting, but is here um, to help lend his expertise where needed. Um, he's been the Klickitat County Noxious Weed Control Coordinator for over 30 years. He has a wealth of knowledge and we lean on Marty regularly to give sound advice and assist us with all things weeds. He has been particularly involved in this project and doing many of the treatments himself. And while he's not giving a presentation, he will be available for the Q&A portion of the evening. So with that, I think we're just gonna get started with Josh's presentation right off the bat. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here and thank you for that fantastic introduction. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, going to be an exciting uh, uh, talk today. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of interesting uh, subjects, uh, primarily the lanternfly. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit more detail on this pest. Um, and just uh, my goal for today's talk is really to have you become more familiar with the pest um, and to uh, give you a heads up. Tree of Heaven is a running theme in this whole event. So 
this is going to be a uh, an exciting talk, and um, yeah, let's uh, let's get on with it. Oh, hang on, let's see here. There we go. All right. Well, uh, so basically, what is actually the spotted lanternfly? Uh, lanternflies are are the Latin name Lacoma delicatula is actually a plant hopper in the family Fagoridae. There's actually about 129 genera with about 696 species actually in the world. So it's a fairly um, sm uh, small family when it comes down to insects. Um, nine genres and 17 species are present in North America and worldwide. Lacoma is represented by seven species. Like most plant hoppers, uh, they use their proboscis to feed on sap. And uh, think of it like a strong uh, or a long straw that they use to feed on the actual host plant. Uh, this is done by a piercing sucking effect where they feed on carbohydrates found in the phloem sap, which are nutrient rich compounds, but actually uh, many other plant products uh, typically of um, lacking toxins. And I wanted to show that actually here in the, uh, this slide. This is a, a spotted lantern fly on its uh, back, exposing its uh, mouth parts. Notice that the body is about one inch. And as you can see the proboscis here, um, this image shows it's about a quarter of an inch um, in, uh, inside the uh, straw-like like mouth parts. There's actually two tiny hair-like stylets. You can't see it in this photo, but that's what they use to uh, kind of suck up the uh, juices of the uh, plant. Think of it, um, these little stylets are actually um, a, a, the uh, size of uh, human hair, and they insert that into the uh, plant tissue. And that's actually what they inject or regurgitate their saliva and probe and puncture the plant tissues. And that's where the damage is coming from. Again, spotted lanternfly is a generalist feeder. It can uh, feed on pretty much anything and, and they can easily adapt to their surroundings, making them a form formidable uh, pest to deal with. Um, I'd like to quickly go uh, uh, and give a little background on the insect and its biology, starting with the life uh, cy cycle. Uh, typically, lanternfly eggs hatch in and around May through June. Uh, you can start seeing from June through July the first instars, which uh, close and become the second instar. Molting will happen again in mid-June through mid-July. And this, of course, um, brings us to the third instar. And then July through September, you get a fourth instar. And that's actually where you start to see an uptick on uh, complaints from homeowners, at least on the East Coast. Starting in late July through December, adults are present and do not overwinter. As the temperature drops to freezing levels, adults will die off. Early egg laying occurs from October through November, and these eggs are found in, from October through uh, June the following year when they begin to hatch and the life cycle continues. So uh, we've talked about how spotted lanternfly feeds, its life cycle, but where are uh, spotted lanternflies originally from? Uh, spotted lanternflies uh, is native to Asia. And it's actually found in China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. It was actually introduced in Japan, South Korea, and actually in recently in 2020, excuse me, 2024, in the state of Pennsylvania in Burnt County. Uh, this image here is a really cool geographical map highlighting just how far away from its natural habitat lanternfly is capable of spreading. In South Korea, it quickly got out of hand and spread all over the county in a matter of just three short years. Uh, they actually consider it an invasive species, which has been reported to be negatively impacting grapes and peaches out there. In short, uh, they kind of lost the, the, the battle. In Pennsylvania, the story has actually been significantly different. And I actually like to give um, kudos to the researchers, researchers over there who have been working very hard to uh, actually control the, the invasive species. Uh, what they have said is lanternfly has been detected in 14 eastern uh, states, uh, you know, Connecticut, Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, North Carolina. Let's see here. I got to think. Um, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, um, Ohio, Rhode Island, Indiana, Michigan State. I know I'm forgetting a few more, but the, as you can see, the list is going on. And more to the point, they're, they're starting to uh, take over the East Coast. So this is actually what makes this pest very concerning. It is actually very adaptable to its uh, surroundings. Uh, so this map, I wanted to point out um, the origins of um, where they started out. Um, in Pennsylvania, 
So it basically this map depicts a handful of counties, including Burke County. Let's see here. I'm going to try to get my um, cursor. Hopefully you can see Burke County is right there. Um, the uh, the actual um, let's see here. The Burke County um, it was first detected there, and uh, lanternflight um, does not um, bite or sting. It doesn't kill um, uh, uh, trees. It just feeds on them. So it's a it's a plant stressor. Um, Along with the other stressors, it can cause significant damage to its hosts. All right. So basically, uh, uh, spotted lanternfly is a, a polyphagous feeder. It actually has over 172 host plants, um, according to a, a recent uh, study published back in 2020. Uh, they will feed on many invasive plant species Ornamentals, especially crop such as grapes, hops, um, cherries, uh, and row crops. So this is actually a pest of economic concern to our industry and a very concerning pest to the industry here in Washington State, as well as in the Pacific Northwest region. So back in 2018 and this in 19 and actually up to this point, Washington State Department of Agriculture has actually taken um, a more proactive approach. That's actually our mission, really. It, it ought to be our mission, really. Um, so we've been surveying at these uh, in Washington State. You can see all these little grape icons. Those actually are vineyards all scattered throughout the state. Uh, what we've done, uh, we've gathered uh, visual samples. And that basically means we go to these uh, vineyards. And we actually inspect the uh, in vineyards for invasive species. And on our list of invasive species that we're looking for, uh, lanternfly is, happens to be on the top of that list. Why do we really care? <laughs> well, obviously, it's because of the economic interest that this pest um, uh, basically holds for us. You know, obviously, Washington State is actually the second largest producer of premium wines in the nation. Uh, with bottles sold in actually 50, all 50 states uh, and has been exported worldwide. So actually, according to the Washington State Wine Commission, uh, we're actually home to over a thousand wineries here in Washington State. I think that's fascinating. We've got over 400 grape growers and there's well over 60,000 60, acres of vineyards. Uh, so this is actually a you know, real concern to the industry and I'm hoping to try to convince you guys tonight and hopefully I've already done so. Uh, but a total economic uh, value is going to be impacted by this lantern flight if it comes to our, our state. It, it actually, our value um, added alone is actually $8.4 billion uh, just in the grape industry. So you can see why uh, WSDA uh, is taking uh, spotted lantern fly very seriously. And we really, really don't want to see this pest in our, um, in, um, our well, in our state, but also in the Pacific Northwest. We don't want to see any of our uh, uh, our neighbors as well with this. So obviously, um, Spotted Lantern, uh, Washington, excuse me, Washington State is um, looking at removing uh, uh, hosts of Tree of Heaven, or uh, uh, Lanternfly, and that's one of what we're looking at is Tree of Heaven. And so again, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I did want to point out the economic impact of this industry that we've got with combined with uh, California and um, Oregon, we're looking at over a $10 billion industry uh, with these specialty crops. So this is actually, this is where it really becomes a concern. In fact, actually, there was a fantastic paper published back in 2020 by uh, Wakey. And this paper was, uh, and my, I should say my uh, colleague, Dr. Uh, Wee Yi as well, he was involved with this. This paper actually shows, and you can see in this image right here, a uh, think of it like a, the weatherman. Uh, a weatherman's um, uh, report where uh, the red highlighted regions are highly susceptible sites for lanternfly establishment. So Walla Walla, Franklin County, Benton, and Yakima are highly susceptible regions for the uh, lanternfly to establish. Note that that's also where the major uh, uh, vineyards, uh, the apple industry, um, all of these specialty crops that we have and we export, uh, they're here. So the thing is, this is why um, WSDA is taking this very seriously. We want to be proactive before the crisis hits. That's my uh, basically the, the, the summary of my talk. Um, so with that said, we're going to keep on going for the sake of time. Now, I'm going to quickly uh, go over Tree of Heaven. This is actually a Class C weed. 
I'm not going to say too much about it because I don't want to steal the uh, um, all of the, the cool information, but this is actually the reproductive host of the uh, lanternfly. So obviously this is a concern to um, us, and I'll show you uh, some of the work I've been doing this year with the uh, contracting out with the uh, um, weed boards. But this is again, Tree of Heaven, it's a noxious weed, you'll find it everywhere. Um, it's basically a, a, a tree kind of slash shrub. Uh, you'll find it's pretty foul smelling if you cut off a, a, a limb. Um, I always tell people, to me, it smells like fermenting peanuts. So it, it doesn't have an, a, an attracting uh, smell. I've had people tell me it doesn't, they've all had different opinions, but you know, that's, that's just, that's where, uh, that's my opinion. I, um, it can grow up to about 30 meters tall. Uh, it can live for, fairly for a long time. You know, we're looking at um, 30 to 50 years, occasionally 100. Uh, it's actually dieceous. You'll actually have male and female. Uh, you know, and also what makes this a very difficult tree to deal with is that if you cut it, just cut the tree down and not treat the tree, um, it can actually turn into a grove. So obviously, um, and it can actually outcompete native vegetation. So that makes this tree a formidable uh, enemy to the industry here. I should also point out, since you know I happen to be a Penatobit specialist, uh, my passion with stink bugs. Um, I'd like to point out this is also the reproductive host plant of the apple or um, uh, brown marmorated stink bug, as well as a, a stink bug that no one's talking about but should be mentioned is the yellow spotted stink bug, which is a, uh, a St. Patrick species or variant of uh, of the uh, brown marmorated stink bug. So that is some more terrifying news, but that's that's for another talk for another day. So again, I did want to just quickly say that these are compound leaves. Uh, very easy. I think they're very easy to identify, uh, but there are some lookalikes that I want you guys to be aware of. Um, again, the bark is fairly smooth uh, with this tree. Uh, one of the uh, things, one of the lookalikes is the sumac. Sumac, I actually kind of thought they were <laughs> tree of heaven for the longest time, uh, but then I realized, no, they have serrated uh, leaves. So, um, and then they, of course, have their uh, classic cones. At least this is what the uh, smooth sumac looks like. Uh, also, another lookalike is the uh, dark walnut. Um, this is actually a uh, native species in this region, and it's actually easy to mix those if you're out in the field and you don't know what you're looking for. So my colleagues will be giving a much a deeper uh, understanding of this tree in the next couple of talks. But for right now, especially for lanternfly, you need to know that, yes, they will go after these hosts, but they really do prefer the uh, tree of heaven. And somewhere in the, their life cycle, they need to be exposed to this tree of heaven. So it's uh, it's kind of important that we kind of get rid of this tree. So that's why that leads us to um, kind of my, uh, my, my work now. Uh, back in uh, 2020, when I came on board with uh, WSDA, I, I really quickly realized that, you know, tree of heaven was going to be a, a major problem with uh, lanternfly. And, uh, you know, of course, we started surveying for this actually this year. We had gotten some funding and, you know, actually contracted out to uh, nine counties in Washington state. Uh, we con uh, contracted out to Benton, Clark, Chelan, let me see, Franklin, uh, Grant, Spokane, uh, Klickitat, uh, Yakima, I think Walla Walla. Um, anyways, I think I got them all. So uh, basically, uh, we've collected over 7,000 um, um, uh, data points across Washington State where Tree of Heaven is established. Uh, you can see Clark County, Klickitat, all the way up in the uh, Columbia River. Great ladder to get into our ag industry. Uh, this is a concern. Up and down the I-5 corridor, that's a great way to establish. Um, and then, of course, Highway 90. You can see where Yakima, Benton, Franklin, Walla Walla, the areas that the uh, Tree of Heaven um, is established is a great staging ground for uh, lanternfly establishment. Again, I like to be very clear, we do not have lanternfly in Washington state, but it's the next couple of slides, it might terrify you, but it's it's incredibly easy to get it in here. So again, what makes it so invaluable? Uh, well, you know, we mentioned, you know, it has all these uh, speed, uh, host plants it goes after, but grapes tend to be a, a, a bit of a spotlight for this pest. So uh, this is, of course, very concerning to Washington state because in addition to the damage to grapes, it uh, also poses a risk to orchards, hardwood woods, nurseries, uh, as well as forestry. All of these industries are major contributors to our economy, so lanternfly poses a significant economic risk to what we have here in our valleys. 
In Pennsylvania, spot lanternfly populations have been detected in managing grapes, and the damage is significant. Whereas spot lanternfly feed on grapes, uh, they'll actually excrete their waste, um, which is uh, called honeydew. Honeydew is actually a very sugary substance. Uh, they'll feed and excrete it, uh, and it lands on grape leaves. And as you can see in these images, clearly this in this picture, uh, these leaves are actually covered with honeydew. Um, because of all the sugar in it, it actually will eventually promote black molds. This, of course, leads to a, a mold problem actually throughout vineyards. Um, and it, sadly, you can't really apply chemistry so late in the season. So that as adults are feeding uh, late in the year, this is where they uh, pose a risk to the grape industry. Spotted lanternfly uh, um, adults lay, of course, on average 30 to 50 eggs. They can be laid on trees or on smooth surfaces. Nymphs are attractive to, uh, uh, excuse me, active crawlers. And every day they crawl up and down plants that they feed on. Um, okay, something else I should point out. Adults begin to appear late summer. They feed primarily on tree of heaven. They mate and lay up eggs. In South Korea, females lay eggs twice before dying. And the uh, USA, it looks like they just create one generation per season. Um, but they have the potential to create two. So as our uh, industry um, is warming up, um, there's, there's concerns for a second generation. Female spotted lanternflies are cap uh, capable of ca uh, carrying up to 150 eggs. And as you recall earlier, I said spotted lanternflies can actually produce 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. So that's actually very concerning. It's possible that they can lay their eggs up to three times, but yet they have been observed not actually to do so. So it also has been noted that males and females can meet multiple times in a year. This is where it is capable of producing a, a, a second generation. And if we've learned anything from stink bugs, uh, the uh, uh, brown marmorated stink bug produces one generation per season on the East Coast, but here in uh, the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast, uh, they produce two. So it's, I mean, I, I don't want to say that, that that could happen with lanternfly, but I don't want to find out. So what makes this um, um, concerning and why should we care is uh, homeowners, uh, business, um, industry. Well, it's actually because of hijacking um, and hitchhiking. So as you can see in these photos, spotted lanternfly will actually lay on just about any substrate. This is one of their indicators is how they are incredibly mobile. These insects um, rarely um, are, even as nymphs, uh, even though they can't really fly, uh, they have this ability to lay their eggs on any surface, including stone or man-made objects, um, is one of the things that makes spotted lanternfly an incredibly good hitchhiker. All stages of the spotted uh, of the spotted lanternfly life cycle are, hitch are are able to hitchhike. So, rewinding the clocks a little to the uh, first lanternfly detections made in Pennsylvania, it actually looks like spotted lanternfly hitchhiked its way from Asia to uh, Pennsylvania on a shipment of landscaping rocks or on a pallet of, um, or on the pallet or on the rocks themselves. We'll, we, we'll never really know, but that's uh, at least our theory or a hypothesis of the origin of lanternfly here in North America. Uh, because of the relative ease of hitchhiking, I'm working with my supervisor, Sven, Sven Eric Spanger, who uh, I should also mention was actually at ground zero in uh, Burke County in Pennsylvania when uh, lanternfly was arrived. Uh, we've been studying rail properties, airports, uh, marine time ports, transportation corridors, uh, commercial and industrial distribution hubs as uh, po possible methods of introduction into Washington state. Oh, let's see here. Um, as you can see uh, in this rail cart uh, is parked. There's actually um, multiple spotted lanternfly host plants all around. If you look behind, there's a whole grove of tree of heaven <laughs> right there. There's a couple, there's actually a little tree of heaven sucker right in front of that, that, uh, that rail cart. And by the way, they actually like rusty colors. So that's an attractive uh, um, uh, um, site where they can lay their uh, egg masses. Um, so here's going to be my most complicated um, uh, slide of the of the night. Hopefully uh, this works, but I want to show you how easy it would be to travel from uh, uh, Pennsylvania to Washington State. Here we go. Whoop. There we go. Oh, good, it worked. So, all right. So that's uh, my concern is I think that the uh, lantern flight could easily be transported here from a rail cart um, from a uh, or, you know, through the air uh, or even by sea. 
But I mean, it's just that easy to get a couple of egg masses in and uh, cause chaos and destruction in our industry. Um, you know, I, I wanted to point out if I have any time, how am I doing for time, by the way? I've got a couple more slides, but I can stop at this point because this really is more in case we have. Yeah, we're looking good, but it's yeah, probably time to start wrapping it up. Thank okay, you. great, great, great. I've got two more slides. I promise I'll stop talking. I promise, folks. Um, but I did want I did want to uh, point out the uh, um, the uh, fact that uh, there are natural enemies that are adapting native natural enemies that are adapting to the lanternfly on the east coast. Uh, so we're actually kind of we're hopeful. Um, predators tend to not be as effective in, in with invasive species. We've seen that with a uh, brown marmorated stink bug, but we are seeing some you know predatorial stink bugs that are adapting to lanternfly. Um, you know, spiders, of course, praying mantis, um, you know, assassins. There's also, I should give a shout out, there's some new development on uh, developing a fungal um, control using a, fun, uh, a fungicide to, uh, um, uh, to a, a spray on a lanternfly. And hopefully that will be something down the road we'll be able to use to uh, prevent the spread. Uh, as right now, uh, it's still being tested, but it's almost to the phase of uh, being used as an application against uh, uh, a lanternfly. So that's actually one of the good news that uh, I can give you, especially from the uh, uh, Entomological Society of America conference that we had last uh, last month. So that that was one of my takeaways from that event. So that's actually very exciting. We, we, we're starting to build tools to combat this pest. Um, other options are IPM options that are being studied right now. Um, of course, is Anastatus and Darrhenus. These are two different species of um, uh, parasitic wasps that are being used for biological control. I should point out that Dr. Kim Holmer, he works for USDA. He's a colleague I'm collaborating with. He's, uh, he's been um, assigned to actually look into these, um, these uh, wasps. And it's actually cool, Darrhenus cynicus. If you look at its forearms, it's got raptorial claws very similar to that of a praying mantis. What they'll do actually is they'll um, they'll actually uh, grab nymphs and actually parasitize them. So you can see this little nymph here. It's like a little bulbous uh, fixture coming out of it. That's actually the parasitic wasp. So it's like a little um, it's like a um, that that film Aliens. It's very uh, terrifying if you ask me. So the uh, little larvae will uh, feed on the human lymph of the uh, nymph. And then it will actually um, suck it dry and then drop out and um, overwinter nearby its host, uh, which is uh, you know populated by uh, lanternflies. And then they'll actually emerge the following year and do the process all over again. And of course, Anastatus orientalis is actually a wasp that will attack eggs, uh, or the egg masses of the uh, lanternfly. So these are really cool um, uh, options that they are being studied right now in uh, uh, North America. Hopefully it will be released soon to uh, deal with this uh, um, pending problem. So basically what can you guys do um, right now? Basically be, be aware of what's happening. Uh, you know, plant promote non-invasive uh, uh, alternatives when you're going out for landscaping. Um, you know, of course, survey for tree of heaven. I, I highlighted this because I'm saying, look, we need your help. We need you to get that data for us so we can actually go out and hopefully with the funding I'm getting, in the next couple of days, we or uh, hopefully this year and uh, next year, we'll be going out to uh, remove Tree of Heaven. That's one of my objectives is to, uh, uh, and one of the reasons why I uh, was surveying for Tree of Heaven this year is now I want to go out and remove Tree of Heaven at key sites to prevent the uh, distribution and establishment of the uh, lanternfly. Like I said, and I'll say it again a hundred times, um, the goal is to prevent um, the crisis from happening. So that is what I'm here as, as a state employee uh, and why I'm taking this very seriously and writing grants to uh, uh, pursue this as, a, as, a, as, as, as one of my projects. So again, 2022, we, we actually got a grant with the state. Um, thank you, Inslee. We were able to get $120,000 and that's what we're primarily using to uh, fund our uh, colleagues uh, with the weed boards to uh, survey for Tree of Heaven. And also, you know, we got an additional seventy thousand dollars, and just actually like three days ago, um, I was I, I was awarded by the uh, uh, gosh, what was it? It was the uh, forestry uh, awarded us a uh, grant uh, of thirty thousand dollars to uh, continue on 
uh, with uh, surveying and tree removal and, and, of course, outreach. So I'm very grateful to have all the uh, funding and support we're getting. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to um, get funding from the state again. So with that said, I just want to say thank you very much for having me here. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll stick around towards the end of this event and uh, hopefully try to answer them as best I can. So with that, I pass the baton. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. Um, we do have a, a couple uh, minutes here if anybody has a specific question that um, they want to get out before they forget it <laughs> for Josh. Um, but like he said, we'll also have some time at the end uh, as well to, to ask questions of all of our presenters. So any, any burning questions for Josh right now or? Moving. Let's keep moving. Um, just want to say it one more time. We don't have lantern fly here yet. Um, you know, I, I will point out uh, we've had close calls uh, back in 2019. Lantern fly adults were detected in uh, uh, California in a uh, um, um, an airplane that was brought over from Pennsylvania. Fortunately, the uh, uh, pressure in the chamber killed them. But we also had some close calls back in 2020 in uh, Oregon. There was some. There was two lantern fly adults that were also found dead. Same story. Um, but that's kind of what I'm getting at here, folks. Actually, uh, this year we intercept um, our colleagues at California, um, our state colleagues, um, they intercepted a egg mass, a viable egg mass down there. So it's um, it's coming, uh, we need to be ready. So I now leave that to uh, you guys to uh, think about that. That's all Gosh. I got. Um, Corey, I think we have you up next. Do you wanna? Yes. Thank you, Josh. That was really interesting. Appreciate hearing your side of what's going on. We uh, definitely have a problem we should be all be aware of. So thank you all for being here to learn about Tree of Heaven and the Spotted Lantern Fly and I'll be talking mostly about our local efforts to control Tree of Heaven and what, why, and how to take action. So some of these slides were um, Josh's that he was sharing with us. And um, so I'll just go in a little more depth on a few of them. But um, like he was saying, they grow the leaves of the Tree of Heaven grow alternately. Um, and I want to emphasize that the leaf edges are smooth. So if you're ever in question on a tree, looking at the uh, edges of the leaves is pretty helpful. Um, they are compound leaves, which means that there's actually 10 to 45 leaflets. So they're quite a lot of leaves. <laughs> and um, The leaflets go opposite each other um, with one on the tip. So another thing to note. Um, and the leaflet base um, has uh, rounded glands on the underside that are pretty pronounced. Um, and again, red stems and midribs. So, um, so the other thing with the bark, I think um, one of the more notable features is that the as the tree ages a little bit um, it starts off first starts off smooth and brownish green um, and becomes more of a fissured um, and it really I think resembles cantaloupe skin um, very it's very similar so that's one kind of determining factor as well um, young branches are yellow or yellow brown uh, to chestnut and there are small little hairs which I honestly don't think are that notable myself, but um, if you look really closely, they are there. Um, and the branches have heart-shaped leaf scars uh, with the uh, rounded butt at the cleft. Again, pretty notable. Um, so as Josh mentioned, they're dioecious. Um, male and female plants are uh, separate. And um, so with the flowers and the um, and the papery wings look like. Um, so, you know, they're pretty obvious from afar, those wings, I feel like are, you know, you see them and it's, um, that's another determining factor that is helpful to note um, that it is tree of heaven. 
Um, so yeah, the uh, flowers are in fluorescence, the bundle, they're bundles of flowers um, and kind of cone shaped. Um, and then individual flowers are light green to white, um, six to eight millimeters wide and have petals, uh, five petals and sepals. So um, yeah, and the uh, winged seeds have one seed per, um, per wing, I guess you could say. Um, and it's, they're one to two inches long and a quarter to three quarters inches wide. Um, and they start yellow, but age to reddish brown. Um, a couple lookalikes like Josh had talked about, but I'll go in a little more depth, um, is the smooth and staghorn sumac because um, the tree of heaven is a sumac. Um, and so this Ruis glabra and Ruis typhina um, are smaller, 10 to 20 feet tall. Um, but again, notice the leaves are serrated, which means um, that they have the little teeth on the edges. And that's a big um, way for you to be able to tell the difference between a tree of heaven and a, a smooth sumac or a staghorn sumac. Uh, staghorn sumac, um, well, both of them actually have these um, crimson flowering panicles. They start off light yellow, green, um, and turn red um, as the season goes on. They like full sun, well-drained soil, and um, need summer wa water until established. So this is actually an alternative plant if you're looking to, um, you know, if you're looking to try to replicate the look of the tree of heaven, um, but they do not grow quite as tall. Um, and then again, just going into a little more of the lookalikes because I think it's important. I've walked by plenty of black walnuts and thought that looks like a tree of heaven and kind of panicked and had people, you know, call us, say, come look at this tree. And, um, and when you do find out that's black walnuts for leaving, um, because, um, again, they have the serrated edges, um, they either will have the catkins, the drooping flowery green catkins, or the fruit, which is quite obvious even from you know down below um, with the green husk and uh, the walnut um, in the center. Um, the bark is a little different, but you know can be a little confusing as the tree ages. Um, so that's another one. And it is I don't know if I said this, but non-native. Um, and then where does the tree of heaven grow? Well, <laughs> quite a large distribution. Um, they do well and send a partial shade um, and they are do excellent on roadsides and disturbed areas. Um, I feel like that's where they thrive the best is in the disturbed areas. Um, Washington um, has high populations, as you can see, Klickitat County, Chelan and Douglas County are um, the highest uh, populations. And um, of course the surrounding counties to us um, as well. So hence the reason we need to be on top of this as much as we can um, so that it doesn't get completely out of control. Although there are some areas where it's getting out of control. So, um, so yeah, Idaho, Oregon, California, Southern British Columbia all have the same problem. And um, I think Josh touched on this, of course, that the native range is China um, and it was introduced to Washington in the 1800s um, to our area, probably more from Sam Boardman in the 30s and 40s. And um, he planted quite a lot of them. <laughs> They're excellent shade trees, so. Um, so, um, UCD is, um, taken on the project, knowing that it's a potentially very large problem, trying to be proactive. And so this summer, fall, we, um, started, you know, doing lots of outreach, um, going to the city council meetings in White Salmon and Bingen, uh, creating a website, as you can see it here, listed here, um, flyers and signage to try to get people aware just around town, um, news articles and social media posts, and, um, you know, attending community events and setting up tables for people to 
um, talk to us live and um, educating school kids. Um, Tova has been doing that and um, hopefully we're touching on lots of different um, you know, ways to, to get the word out. So, and we're open to ideas if anybody has them. Um, here is our video that we created um, as another form of outreach that I'll play for you. It's about three minutes long. So um, here it is. Underwood Conservation District is facilitating a program to help control the spread of the Tree of Heaven and its potential companion, the Spotted Lanternfly. I'm Corey Podolak, and I am the project coordinator of the Tree of Heaven Control Project. We are working with community experts on how to treat this invasive tree. Hi, my name is Jeanette Burkhart. I'm a watershed planner for the Yakima Nation Fisheries Program. Tree of Heaven is a preferred host, meaning it's the preferred food for another invasive species called the spotted lanternfly. Right now at 5.30, a battle against bugs. More pesky spotted lanternflies are being found across the truck. 2008 or so, they found the first spotted lanternfly on the East Coast. And the lanternfly population is exploding right now. And since then, it has really been wreaking havoc on the agricultural industry in the places where it was introduced and it's expanding quickly. This here is a whole crop of Tree of Heaven that started out with maybe a couple seeds that germinated, and now it's turned into basically a whole wall of Tree of Heaven. It has fairly smooth bark when it's young, like this um, seedling here. The leaflets on here are opposite each other. You'll notice that they are smooth around the margins of the leaf, and then it has these two little bumps at the bottom. The other thing you can tell is the leaf scar here is kind of heart shaped. It has kind of a nasty smell. These are the seed pods. Each one of these little papery wings has one seed in it. When the wind catches these, and we all have a lot of wind here in the gorge, it can carry these really far. The other thing that they do is they can reproduce by sending out really long shoots from the roots. Hi, I'm Marty Hudson, Quick Deck County Noxious Weed Control Coordinator. So one of the issues of if you cut the tree and don't treat it, it regrows here. And then this is a sidewalk. And if you go across the sidewalk here, you can see where the trees are popping up along the edge of the street. They will uh, sucker up off the roots after you cut them down and they can be pretty destructive. And if you don't treat them with the herbicide, they'll just sucker back more. So yeah, the best way to treat them is to actually do it chemically. For more specific information, uh, please get a hold of us. So we really all need to do our part to protect both natural habitats as well as our agricultural industry by trying to get rid of these pest trees. The time to treat the tree of heaven is now. Check our Facebook page and our website for more information about the Tree of Heaven. Okay, so I may cut that off a little bit there, but um, I think you saw the majority and um, yeah, so then I wanted to just talk to you guys about the progress that we made this um, summer and fall. Um, September and October were the primary um, times that we were treating the Tree of Heaven um, and luckily had a lot of help from Marty at Click Attack County Weed Control. Um, Cindy and a crew came out um, from Skimania County um, not just weed control. And then Ryan Adams from the city of White Salmon also um, helped us do some treatments. So we've had lots of help and we are so appreciative of that because we were able to treat 26 uh, private landowners residences in White Salmon and Bingen, total totaling approximately um, 1,180 trees. And uh, additionally, um, business parking lots along the railroad. We we're kind of trying to look at the railroad in particular because of the fact that the spotted lanternfly may 
um, come to us on the railroad on trains. Um, so that's a consideration. Um, we also were looking at, um, you know, public lands. Uh, so we were, we treated um, 400 trees in Bingen and white salmon. Uh, again, these are approximations, can't be exact um, because they're, some of them were just huge groves of trees. Um, so we made a dent. Um, and then treatment results. Um, this is just one example of kind of how the trees started to look um, once the treatments kind of kicked in um, and they, you know, just looked brown and wilty and sick. Um, so that was good to see. Um, and then we're going to be monitoring in the spring of 2023 with the property owners um, to see, you know, what uh, trees have leaves coming back and what which trees do not. Um, some trees um, will definitely need follow-up treatments. And um, the trees that do die from the treatments we performed uh, can be removed. So that'll be, um, you know, most likely June, um, maybe even July before we determine for sure if a tree is dead because we just don't want to remove it and then cause more problems. Um, and then we, we are planning to help people replant the Tree of Heaven sites with native species. Um, so stay tuned and we'll be reaching out to anyone that was involved. Um, again, Josh touched on this, um, on ways that you can report the Tree of Heaven. Uh, EDDmaps.org um, is, a, is a great site to use. Um, there is also the Invasive Species Washington WA.gov um, report a sighting um, website. They're both very similar where you browse for your uh, species and um, you set the location of the sighting. You can take a photo. I think that's optional. Um, write a description um, or comments and then you select report and submit. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, I believe you do have to create accounts for both of them. Um, so something to just you know, consider, but definitely would be helpful if people help report. Um, so then this just is letting you all know that, you know, there's other people involved, obviously, Skamania and Klickadat County, um, but then Benton, Chilean, Clark, Franklin, um, Spokane and Yakima uh, control boards have all been involved. Um, and Walla Walla County Conservation District as well. Um, and this just gives you an idea of um, the funds that we've secured, although um, there are deadlines on some of them, so it gets a little tricky um, with that, but we're hoping to secure more funding uh, so that we can continue treatment for um, at least a couple of years. Um, just another couple of slides on like treatment or you know how to manage and then um, Emily and Phoebe well Emily will go into the treatments uh, more in depth but um, wanted to point out that you know the seedlings and small plants can be pulled or dug out when the soil is most moist but that's key to consider just that the soil cannot be dry because you're going to end up snapping off a root and then causing more problems so please be aware um cutting and mowing alone will not be effective you could do that but then you have to treat the sites as well um and then uh, also be aware that stems and stumps can re-sprout if they're left in a moist soil so um be aware of fruit fragments and and uh stems so another tricky topic properly disposing of all the plant materials um we believe the best thing we, we can be doing right now is chipping and keeping the chips on site. Um, we were hopeful that we could use um, dirt hugger, but we're finding that potentially there um, that could lead to spreading the tree of heaven. So we're kind of backtracking on that and um, we're encouraging chipping and leaving the um, chips on site. Um, and then monitor, make sure to monitor your, your site um, up to 50 feet away from the root sucker sprouts um, or where the, from the mother plant because they obviously travel quite far. Um, 
so then our the methods we used again to let Emily and um, Marty with questions um, answer more of this, but we used the foliar spray primarily, um, and that's when the leaves are out. You use you know backpack sprayer as your quickest option, and you just really spray all of the leaves um, and uh, watch out for nearby plants that are not tree of heaven. Um, glyphosate and triclopyr are what the recommended um, herbicides are. And um, hack and squirt was our other primary method. Um, and that is um, minimizes sprouting and root suckers. Again, done in the summer, early fall. It's just a small window, unfortunately. Um, and the, the idea is periodic cuts around the trunk so that you leave some live bark too, um, so that the tree doesn't think I'm dying, I have to spread, set out all these, send out all these sprouts. Um, and then recommended herbicides um, by the experts are glyphosate and amazapyr. So always follow label instructions and local laws and regulations. Um, obviously herbicides are not something to take lightly and use good gloves, I discovered. <laughs> A um, couple notes on the cultural and biological control. Um, establishing a healthy stand of desired vegetation is one of the best things you can do because um, it will shade out the seedlings. Um, Tree of Heaven loves sun. And so if you can create shade um, in the areas where it wants to grow, that would, that's really helpful. Um, there are no, no biological control agents currently approved in Washington state. There's definitely research being done on different options. Um, you know, tried to do a lot of reading on the debarking and um, oyster methods, which just have mixed results, unfortunately, but um, hopefully we'll get to a point where we have other options besides herbicides. Um, and then grazing can weaken roots, but potentially cause resprouting. Again, um, I think that it always has to be combined with herbicides from what I can tell. Um, and then um, wanted to let you all know we have an optional field trip tomorrow. Um, it is obviously Friday. Uh, we'll be meeting at 2 p.m. at the White Salmon Bakery. And um, we will see the Tree of Heaven specimen. Um, and there's also one that we treated at the Harvest Market parking lot we wanted to show show you so you could see. Um, it's a little tricky in the winter because they, they don't have many leaves, but um, you can at least get to see, you know, where we did some treatments. Um, and uh, Marty said that he would be able to perform a treatment. Obviously, it's not the ideal time of year, but at least will allow people to see the hack and squirt method uh, so that you can have confidence in doing it yourself, hopefully. Uh, please RSVP to my email corey at ucdwa.org if you plan to attend and uh, last but not least thank you to everyone that has helped in this effort um, and continues to help in this effort couldn't have done it without you um, here is uh, our contact info if you have more questions beyond this um, presentation Oh, and also consider attending the Invasive Species and Exotic Pest Conference in Stevenson, February 23rd, 2023. I think it's an all-day conference or from 9 to 3. So Emily Stevenson um, can tell us more about that. And questions anybody has for me? Oh, perfect. Thank you, Corey. And um, yeah, if we have questions now, you can either type it in the chat or just um, raise your hand and unmute, ask directly. If there's anything about the UCD projects particularly, we'll also again have a chance at the end. A um, couple now if anybody's got a burning question. Otherwise, I think I'll queue up. Um, I think maybe Phoebe is going to go first. Is that right? Got Phoebe Emily coming up. If you're ready, Phoebe, you can grab the controls. Yes, thank you so much, Jan. Okay. Uh, so, as uh, Toba had mentioned earlier, my name is Phoebe Judd, and I am the 4 H Mentoring Program Coordinator 
for um, uh, WSU Extension in Skamania County. And I run a program called Forest Youth Success with my coworker Summer. And this year we were able to partner with Skamania County Noxious Weeds to perform a Tree of Heaven project with our crews. And so uh, just a little bit about Forest Youth Success. It, this is a local summer program that allows teens to work and gives them work experience and lifelong skills uh, while we support the needs of the US, US Forest Service and our other project partners. Um, and this year we got to partner with Skamania County Noxious Weeds because we were able to get a Columbia Gorge cooperative weed management area grant uh, for about $5,000 that would allow us to cover the training and labor cost of having our crews go to homeowners land uh, and survey for Tree of Heaven. So we kind of did this project in four different um, parts. First was the training where we went over concerns that the kids had about going door to door, asking people to um, look at their, uh, look around their properties. They had to learn how to ID the tree of heaven. And then they were just basic communication skills and public speaking skills. Cause sometimes that um, thought of talking to someone, a stranger at their door is a little bit scary. Then the second part of this project was actually going out and doing the neighborhood surveys. And we had three crews this year and they were able to go to Stevenson, Carson and Underwood. So many homes were surveyed in all three of those areas uh, over the course of about three weeks. And then the next part of our project was our social media outreach. And every crew got to do a, create a Facebook post with information that they wanted to share with the community. And we did a little uh, competition to see who got the most reach, who got the most likes, who got the most shares on Facebook. And then the last piece was a small select group of students got together to create an educational display for the Skamania County Fair, um, which they created and then put up um, for everyone to see in the exhibit hall. And from those, um, from this project, we were actually able to get 324 properties surveyed by our crews. Uh, that's about 215 acres. And then the Facebook posts reached about 2,700 people. And of that number, 565 people actually interacted. So they either liked it or shared the post to their feed as well. And then thousands of people were able to see the educational display at FAIR, which did win a blue ribbon and a Judge's Choice Award. Um, so we were very proud of our kids there. Um, but that is most of my information that I have, but I have some just photos that I would love to share with you. Um, this is um, Skamania County Noxious Weeds employees uh, training our students on public speaking and then how to use the uh, phone to uh, report sites of the tree of heaven. And then we have our crews here doing their social media outreach, making their Facebook posts um, at the Hegelwald Center. And here is our some of the public outreach we did. We were able to have a crew go, go and talk to the um, county commissioners at a board of county commissioners meeting um, and talk about the work that they were doing with the Tree of Heaven and um, how that project was going. We also had students talk about the project at our end of season luncheon that we do at the end of every successful forest youth success season in mid-August, uh, where they were able to share with all of the community members that we invite to that luncheon about the Tree of Heaven. And then this was the educational display that the kids made for the fair. Um, they really wanted to play up the fact that the spotted lanternfly is a detriment to our agricultural products. 
and wanted people to understand the significance of that. And that's what I have for our Forest Youth Success Tree of Heaven project. Perfect. Thank you, Phoebe. Emily, you want to queue up and then we can take questions at the end. Sure. Can you guys see that? Yep, looks good. Okay, uh, so just want to say quickly, it was um, the the project working with FYS this summer was probably one of our favorite projects. Uh, it was really great to work with the kids and uh, just see them grow over those couple of weeks. And they definitely started out shy and not wanting to to really talk to people, and uh, but they really got into it and um enjoyed you know being out in their community and i know that they were constantly looking you know past that project being on the lookout for uh, tree of heaven and uh, i think they even found it at one of their other sites and and talked with the land manager there to uh, to you know about how to handle that and so it really was a great project and i hope that we can work with them again next year on something uh, so just quickly, I wanted to go over what we have been doing in Skamania County. Uh, we actually applied for funding back in 2020 from the State Department of Agriculture. That was funded in 2021, and that was basically just to do some surveys. I, I knew we had it in certain places, but um, it wasn't real prevalent in our county, but we needed to do the, uh, a more comprehensive survey and then also start doing some treatments and see what worked. Um, so we started out doing that and uh, we also did a little bit of outreach along with um, the state uh, department of ag and then also the invasive species council. And from that outreach, we were able to get um, locals who had seen that and contacted us and said, hey, I think I've got it. You know, can we get some help? And so we did end up assisting seven landowners. There were some negative surveys, thankfully. Um, and that was really the first uh, time that we had done Tree of Heaven treatment. So we didn't really know what to expect, uh, but it, it went well. So um, let's see here. Not sure how to advance here. Okay, did that work? Uh, so in 2022, we uh, partnered, obviously, with the UCD on their large project there in uh, Klickitat County. And then, um, like what uh, Phoebe was saying with the uh, FYS crew, uh, we worked with them on that. And then we did a, another big kind of education outreach uh, push, just in terms of getting the word out about, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it. So with the FYS uh, project and the stuff that we did, we have over 400 properties in Skamania County that have been surveyed. Um, 61 of those sites were confirmed uh, positive for Tree of Heaven. And that is a total of 54 landowners. And you'll see this is a map of what we've identified in Skamania County and the majority of the Tree of Heaven is found in those residential areas in Stevenson and Carson. So again, we have 61 total sites so far confirmed. Seven of those were treated in uh, 2021 and we retreated two of those in 2022. And then 26 new sites were treated in 2022. Uh, so a little over half of the sites have been treated. And we're working um, on, we've already applied for some future funding to hopefully continue this work into next year and um, with the goal of eradicating Tree of Heaven from Skamania County. So um, I wanna go into how to control Tree of Heaven and start out with this simplified graphic um, about the you know kind of tree biology and basically, um, what we're trying to show here is um, 
how the tree works in terms of energy that it gets from the sun through photosynthesis. So in the spring, when trees break bud and uh, start to put on leaf growth, they're actually using stored energy from the year before. And then once they have new leaves on there, they photosynthesize and they, they're using that energy to put on new growth and um, flower and set seed. And then late in the summer, after that seed has been uh, produced, then that's when the tree starts to move that energy from the sun back into the root system. And the reason why I wanna talk about this is because that is really critical in uh, having an, an effective control of Tree of Heaven. So timing is critical. You wanna do it in, in that time period when the tree is moving sugars down through the tree and into the root system. Uh, there are multiple methods that are uh, effective for Tree of Heaven, um, some more than others. Um, Unfortunately, like Corey was saying, at this point, uh, you, you pretty much have to use an herbicide in order to effectively control Tree of Heaven. And the main thing you, you do not want to do is just cut it because that will actually just make it way worse than, than what you have to begin with. Um, cutting will stimulate the growth of Tree of Heaven and it just, it suckers, it sends up uh, suckers from, from its root system, and you end up just with a, a grove of uh, tr different trees. So um, there is a document that the Columbia Gorge Cooperative Weed Management Area put together a couple of years ago uh, based on best management practices for Tree of Heaven. And this can be found on their website, which is ColumbiaGorgeCWMA.org. And if you go to that menu there that's highlighted in red, the weeds menu, you'll find best management practices. And then you actually find a whole uh, list of different weeds, but Tree of Heaven is on there. So a lot of this information that I'm talking about is in that document and um, is, is easily downloaded for you. So the first uh, method that I, that I want to talk about is a foliar spray. And this is really to be utilized for younger, shorter trees. Uh, this is you know, not something you really want to do for, if it's over your head, you don't want to typically spray over your head. Uh, but this utilizes a um, dilution of chemicals. So you want to use a systemic herbicide and that's why we're uh, suggesting triclopyroglyphosate that will move into the root system. And you just, um, it's, it's diluted. So typically common uh, products at the, on the store shelf, uh, like crossbow, which is a combination of triclopyr plus 2,4-D, um, or Roundup, which is glyphosate. Those are typically found in a concentrated form and you add water to it. Some products are already ready to go, so you just want to be sure that you know uh, what you're getting. And of course, read the label. Uh, the next method I want to talk about is um, kind of my preferred method for larger trees. Um, this is the hack and squirt method. And you basically make, you know, find a sharp tool like an ax or something and make cuts into the cambium layer. Uh, and space them around the tree um, and then insert an undiluted concentrated herbicide. Uh, you wanna leave some uncut tissue. So you don't, you're not making a complete cut around the tree, but, but spacing it out and then putting that systemic herbicide in there. Uh, this method, the injection, uh, is something that we utilized for the first time this year. This is done with an easy jet lance. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not available for landowners um, because you have to have a license in order to purchase the chemical cartridges. Uh, but you can see there that those are uh, very similar to like a 22 shell 
And those uh, cartridges have, um, in this case, amazapir is the chemical in it. It's a water soluble. And so it's injected into uh, the tree's cambium and then it takes that herbicide and moves it down into the root system. This is a really kind of slow process. Amazapir typically works a lot slower than some other herbicides. And so um, one of the things that we had trouble with this year is just waiting for you know, any kind of sign of death. And, um, and, and honestly, we just don't know exactly how effective it's gonna be, but it was definitely worth a shot. Uh, it's, it's definitely cleaner to use it. Um, and it's, I know uh, people have used it on other uh, invasive trees. And so it's just, it's something, uh, it's new to us and, and we'll see what happens. Uh, the other thing with, with all of these uh, treatments is you've got to wait until, you know, basically six months from now to really find out how effective we are because of the timing of us doing it in the fall when typically trees are losing their leaves anyway. Um, you just really have to kind of wait it out and, and see, you know, how effective it is. And then the last method that I want to talk about is a uh, cut and daub. So cut and daub is, is um, uh, really effective for a lot of other woody species. We'll use it on um, scotch broom and sometimes blackberry if it's, you know, we've just got a little bit of it. Uh, but it's not the preferred method for Tree of Heaven. Um, we kind of have relied a lot on our colleagues on the East Coast because they've do, been doing a lot more Tree of Heaven um, control. And so this is one that you really want to kind of only utilize in certain situations. And that would be maybe if you've got, you know, some small seedlings that are too, too small to do the hack and squirt method, um, or you've got it in a flower bed where you want to be really um, have a targeted approach where you, so you're, you're not damaging other non-target uh, species. Uh, but the, the key with this is to have a fresh cut. Um, so don't give the tree time to um, kind of heal over on that cut. And then again, you're applying a full 100% concentrate herbicide that's gonna move down into the root system. And you really just need to apply it to the outside edge um, where the tree is alive. The, the uh, heartwood in the middle is, is not gonna move anything down. So you don't need to waste your time doing that. That way you just uh, kind of paint the outside like you can see there uh, in those photos. And um, we like to use a sponge. Some people use paint brushes or anything that really um, can just paint that herbicide on. And we did use this uh, in, in one case here that you can see, um, but that was really just kind of a, a backup to a backup. Uh, this was a, a very large tree that we were treating and we just, we had treated it with an injection, first of all, uh, at the end of August, I believe. Uh, went back about six to eight weeks later and did a hack and squirt on it, and then um, then painted the stump after it was taken down. We re we really just wanted to make sure this thing was going to die. So this is the tree. Actually, this was uh, a tree in Stevenson. You can see how close it is to a house, and um, it was <laughs> it was a big effort. So this tree was approximately eighty feet tall. Um, we measured it like 33 inch diameter and about 50 years old. It was actually a gorgeous tree, but uh, the landowners were well aware of tree heaven and the damages that it could uh, do to their infrastructure. And we're already seeing some of those things. They had tree heaven popping up in between their garage and house foundation. And so, um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a kind of a big, big task for us. And we actually had to have an, a certified arborist take this thing down just because of the, um, the closeness to the, to the house and other infrastructure. So um, with that, I think um, 
that concludes what I have. Um, I did not put any uh, my contact information, but I can easily be found uh, with just Skamini County Noxious Weed Program. And um, we're always happy to help. And if you have any questions, definitely reach out to us. I know Marty will say the same thing. Uh, there, so with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Emily. Yeah, we have um, plenty of time for questions, folks. And um, Tova promised you a quiz before she left. And so that uh, is my pleasure now to administer your quiz to see how well you were all listening for that. Um, so I'm gonna throw our second poll up here on the screen. Um, hopefully you all can see that. We appreciate your playing along with us. Uh, I get to do that and, and also, yeah, think of any questions you have. You can throw them in the chat or you can just raise your hand and unmute. We're a small enough group. I think we can keep it sane even talking directly, so. I uh, this is Dan Ball. I've just got a quick question uh, on the hack and squirt control method. You you mentioned triclopyr and glyphosate, and then for the cut stop treatment, uh, would those two products also be what you'd recommend for that? They would, yeah. So so really, uh, you're looking for a sy systemic herbicide that's going to move through uh, the root system. And those are the, those honestly are the, the two that we, and, and amazapir are the, the three uh, that we utilize the most here in Skamani County. Um, they're, they're fairly safe to use and they're also easiest to find uh, for homeowners uh, on, just on the shelf in the hardware store. But it, it, it seems like your, the hack and squirt method was uh, what you would prefer uh, recommending. And then the, but the cut stump would work, you know, in, in certain situ situations, it seems like as well. Yeah, I, they definitely have had um, less success with cut stump uh, just because of that. I think cutting initially is, you know, the tree just kind of freaks out and, st and it stimulates the growth. And so um, what they've said on the East Coast is that you really want the tree to die a slow death. And so doing that, um, that hack and squirt um, is, and, and the injection um, is, is, are the kind of the best methods for that. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, and I, I have another comment uh, that's kind of trivia, but uh, you might want to get on and Google uh, Tree of Heaven in Port Townsend because uh, there's a story that the tree of heaven was introduced uh, to the United States in the 1860s uh, by a, a Chinese uh, uh, person that was coming over and bringing, bringing the tree of heaven as a gift uh, to San Francisco. And anyway, you, you can find that story if you, if you Google Port Townsend uh, tree of heaven. And in Port Townsend, and a matter of fact, there, there are plaques in town uh, that describe this, this tale. It, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Thank you. I think I've seen that. And while we're Googling things, I, there's a great uh, kind of scary news story out of Portland uh, where uh, a guy had his neighbor had a tree of heaven who, who he just cut it down and it ended up just totally damaging and ruining the, his neighbor's foundation on his house. And so it really kind of shows, um, you know, what what the risks are in, in just cutting down Tree of Heaven. Yeah, I had a friend in Boise that had uh, a lot of Tree of Heaven in, in her backyard and she cut it down and it just made the problem worse. Uh, so, yeah, and then I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the Tree of Heaven along I-84. If you travel from, I'm in Hood River, you travel, you travel east along I-80 and it's just solid in some places. 
along there. So it's going to be an uphill battle for for an eradication program. And then one more, you got me, you got me talking now. Uh, one other plant that's quite similar uh, in appearance to Tree of Heaven is the desert false indigo. If, if you're familiar with that one, uh, our soil and water conservation district here in Hood River County uh, is kind of keying in on false indigo uh, because it, it does look quite a lot like um, Tree of Heaven. So uh, just a little bit of trivia there. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Kurt, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Hey, thanks. Yeah, Emily, I just had a question about the exact treatment window. And I know that people, you know, it's hard to offer dates because each weather, you know, summer is going to be different than another summer. But is there something you're looking for in the summer to say, all right, we're starting, it's time, like I see this in the tree, or it's been two weeks since the, you know, rain turned off or something. And then similarly in the fall, is there something you're looking for to say, yep, can't, can't really treat it any more effectively, season's kind of over. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And honestly, we're still kind of <laughs> trying to figure out uh, what that window is here. I think um, what, you know, what they, they tell you is after it's, you know, produced that seed. So I don't know, I think that's around August uh, here in the Northwest. Um, I think as, you know, as early as mid to late August, you can start. And then uh, in 2021, we kind of had an early fall and um, I ended up treating a couple of smaller trees uh, where they, the leaves were actually already falling off and those end up, did end up dying. So um, I think it's, you know, it's okay to kind of push the limit uh, in terms of that late, uh, late treatment. But really, we're, the, that's kind of one of the things that we're, you know, we're just finding out and, and really working through those things because we haven't ever really done much treatment here in the Pacific Northwest. Cool, thank you. And then just share the results from our poll here real quick. And um, yeah, Emily and Marty, you can take a look, see how well we all did <laughs> capturing uh, the treatment information and let us let us know if we. Yeah, it looks like everyone got the uh, the idea that we should not just be cutting it. <laughs> so that's that's the main thing. And I also just want to um, draw your attention to Josh put a number of good uh, links in the chat for you. Um, so some span, uh, spotted lantern fly links um, there, as well as um, some tree of heaven information. So make sure to check those out. Um, and I did put that link to the best management practices that you were talking about, Emily, from the Columbia Gorge uh, weed, weed management area website. Um, so good links there to, to check out. Just please feel free if you have any uh, questions for any of our speakers um, tonight. One, one other thing that I didn't mention was just the, the need to kind of monitor uh, after you've done treatments and you know follow up with any um, secondary treatments because that's that's always key and making sure that we're successful is, is going back to those sites and, and, and checking. And then also, you know, there's gonna be probably some seed uh, in the soil that is viable for a few years. So um, definitely monitoring that is key. Is your hand up again or was that a ghost hand from before? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I have another question. You can answer Danica's first if, if that. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see another hand up, but yeah, if there's someone else with a question, go ahead too. Or questions in the chat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Phoebe. Um, yeah, so she asks, uh, where can we find out more about available grants for Tree of Heaven control? I was just about to uh, send my uh, email so everyone can uh, contact me for that question. So, yeah, let me. And Danica, I don't know if you're where you're located. 
if you're in Skamini County, we um, are committed to, you know, to getting this done. Uh, the, the main cost for us is taking down some of those larger trees with a certified arborist. Um, so we have kind of sought funding to help us do that. Um, but if you're, you know, you're a local, you know, we definitely can, can work something out. Work something. I'm, I'm not local. I'm actually um, with the Lewis County Noxious Weed Control. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Mike, I think I kind of get the answer by what you're saying about arborists, but I, I do I do see, or I thought about this a lot, and there's kind of a, there's the dying, having the tree die a slow death, which is, you know, the goal, it sounds like a really good treatment option. Um, and also there's like urban large trees of heaven, and if they're dying slow death, they're like dropping large branches and that that kind of being um, opposing <laughs> opposing interest. So are, do you think like large trees in urban environment, it's what you did with that that tree, like treat it, treat it again, treat it, cut it down, then treat it a third time and that, you know, but like you can't you can't just really let it die unless it's really removed from sidewalks or traffic or stuff like that. Right. And, and that's honestly why we were kind of pushing to um, make sure that it was dead before we cut or at least really dying um, as, as best as we could see. Because uh, we were, you know, the, the landowner definitely wanted to get it out before, you know, winter time. And, um, and then we were also kind of up, up against a grant deadline. So um, what we've um you know we asked folks on the east coast what they thought about that and they said you know depending on the size of the tree we were kind of expecting you know no earlier than 30 days you know cut the tree but with with that large tree it just took a lot longer for it to to die and so it, it really depends on the size of the tree um but if you can you know start in late august mid to late august um like we did and then it was it it, had, it was definitely showing mortality signs um, when it finally came down at the end of November so I, I think that is um, is manageable and then of course we will be following up to make sure um, that there's not more suckers coming up I was just going to uh, mention that's going to be key you're going to have to uh, once you do your application the first year you're going to have to definitely follow up the following year to make sure you get all those roots. Otherwise, you're not going to win. So, no, uh, well done, Emily. That's that's exactly right. You you uh, follow up, and then uh, you know if you see anything, retreat, and then I'll follow up the following year. So it could it could be up to about three years by the time you get stuff done. I was going to have um, Emily and Marty maybe elaborate um, just for people to make note which herbicides um, affect other plants or which ones you want to be the most cautious with with surrounding plants. Yeah, so uh, the amazapir is one that will move through the soil. Um, so that's something to definitely uh, be cautious about. And I'm not sure how available it is just for the, the general homeowner. Uh, but the other two are fairly safe and won't really move through the soil once it's um, once it's in the roots. So uh, planting afterwards, you know, obviously, like we were saying, you're going to have to follow up and make sure that those uh, initial treatments were successful. So you may want to hold off a season just to see, um, you know, what kind of shows up and and um, but but really you know, it shouldn't be much of an issue with the herbicides. Unless, of course, you're doing a foliar spray and, and you, you know, there's drift or you hit non-target species. Marty, do you have anything to add to that? No, I would agree with what Emily said pretty much that the uh, tree, the, amaz the amazapir was probably the one that could go out through the roots and affect neighboring plants and so and it's it's shown that where the state 
Parks did some down there by uh, Horse Thief that, that it can move out through the roots and affect neighboring trees and shrubs. So <clears throat> that would be the one to be cautious with. And, and even the glyphosate could potentially spread out a little bit through the roots. So you just have to kind of look things over pretty good before you treat it. And the follow-up is really critical, I believe. Okay, sorry, I know I'm asking a lot of questions. Just just one more, because I've, I've talked to a few arborists about this. I, I did have an arborist tell me that they will, they will cut a tree of heaven at any point during the year, as long as they can stump, stump grind really well. And then that would be an effective, you know, as long as they can get a lot of that uh, root system kind of stump ground, it'll it'll be effective kill. Do you, do you have a sense if that is accurate? I would be well, afraid of that. <laughs> I'm pretty skeptical of that, personally, from what I've seen. I think the, uh, the root system is, is so much bigger than, you know, what what you see. Um, and so I think I, I would definitely, especially if it's, if it's around, you know, any kind of infrastructure, sidewalks, houses, um, roads, you know, some, you know, if it's, unless it's out in the, in the middle of a field somewhere where you're, where, where you're not too worried about it, um, I would definitely be skeptical. Thank I'd like you. to also point out that uh, the hack and squirt method is working on the uh, East Coast. In fact, they are seeing in areas where they've been uh, pushing back the Tree of Heaven, uh, they are seeing a uh, population decrease of lantern flies in those areas. Um, so, no, I, I would like what everyone's saying here. I, I'm just going to agree and say the slow method is the is the best best method. So, um, no, I, I'm not entirely sure about the. Uh, um, stump ground um, approach. I I I I just kill the tree uh, the the roots. That's my advice. These are all great questions. Don't don't worry about asking too many. I have another one that I've had people ask me that um, just figured it would be good to share um, is how long after herbicides been applied um, in an area to can you replant? I guess it probably depends on the herbicide a little bit, but Emily and Marty, I know you have more expertise. And I think it depends on the site and how many trees are there and what kind of follow up you're going to end up having to do. So. Um, you don't you don't want to plant too soon because you may you know need to go in there and and do some follow-up treatment um, and again you know it depends on the herbicide but probably you know um, maybe the fall you know a year after the initial treatment I would wait a couple of years if you were using a mazapir and the other, if you use, uh, yeah, the fall or the following year, if you were using uh, glyphosate or triclopyr. Thank you. Any other questions for our presenters? Yeah, okay, I'll ask one more, last one. Um, so I, I worked a lot with the city of Vancouver urban forestry on this. So that's kind of my, my thoughts are more in the urban setting and their public works department almost exclusively uses the, the cut and then dab. I think you called it, yeah, cut and dab. Do you, I mean, you seem pretty not confident in that method. Do you think it has just limited effectiveness or, or essentially no effectiveness if it's just a one-off treatment? I, would, I, I think it's limited. I, I just think it's not as effective. Um, personally, we, I don't believe I've done any cut and daub on Tree of Heaven. 
um, only because I just heard, you know, from folks on the East Coast that they were really going away from that method. Um, Marty may know more if he's maybe done some in the past. Yeah, we've done some down in Rock Creek along the road where they cut them off and then treated with uh, triclopyrin oil. <clears throat> and it worked pretty well, but it's uh, there's a lot of regrowth comes that from the suckers off of the root systems. So you don't, killing those roots is what's really critical. And that's why I th think the hack and squirt works better because of that. And you're not de dealing with all that debris right up front when the, le the tree's full of leaves and I mean, obviously you're going to be dealing with a, a dead tree later, but. Okay, well, um, thank you so much to all of our presenters for being here and taking the time to help us understand this and to all of our um, participants here to listen and learn and hopefully help spread the word about these two invasive um, pests that we yeah, really need to, to all be aware of and be working on. I do have one last poll for you. Um, if you humor us one more time, this kind of just helps us understand um, how you heard of this and, and helps us improve for future uh, webinars. So if you don't mind, um, just taking a second to answer that. Um, I see that Emily also just put her contact information in the chat. So make sure and um, reach out. And like she said, it, uh, it's also easily Googleable. <laughs> new, new if you uh, need to find her. And Corey's got our Underwood Conservation uh, District information up there as well. So oh, again, I really appreciate um, all of you being here tonight. Joe, if you have any follow-up questions um, or retrieve heaven on your property that you need help with. And um, yeah, Corey, do you have any, any last for us? Um, I think just that I'm glad that we had all these experts together. It's really cool to hear everybody's input and just that everyone's working really hard at controlling these invasive species. So um, hopefully, you know, gave people some hope <laughs> and uh, yeah, just keep collaborating. It seems like it's, it's very valuable. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for put, putting this on. Yes, thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks everyone. We're going to let you let you go. Happy holidays, and um, we will hopefully see you at our uh, next webinar in January. So, have a good night. <laughs>